Hey, yo, what's good? Slime House Podcast, myself, The O'Kane, and today I've got an awesome guest on the show. So one of the few things that's been a silver lining about lockdown is that usually when you try and get in touch with people, you have to work around busy schedules and that kind of thing. At the minute, everybody's at home. Most people are at home and they can't work and they're, they're all on lockdown. And especially if they work in TV and film like this guy does, then all that industry is currently being put on hold. He's slightly filtering back ever so slightly now, but for the past month or so, the past couple of months, all this stuff's been locked down, so it's been a perfect time to get in touch with people and sit down and have a chat with them, and this is a guy that I've wanted to get on Slimehouse TV in some form for a, such a long time, but it's always been a scheduling conflict thing like that, because this guy is so busy, so I was blessed to be able to get him on the show for an hour earlier today. I'm talking, of course, about Dominic Brunt, so you might know this guy as Paddy from Emmerdale. Like I said, this guy works in film and TV. He's been on Emmerdale, the TV show, the famous British soap for the past I don't know, he started in 1997 he's been on this thing a long time, he's like I tell him in this podcast that his face is like such an iconic part of the British homestead, his face is so familiar to so many people, but then he also leads this double life where on the side, he makes crazy horror movies, he's made three movies so far and they're all awesome in their own way you've got Before Dawn, which horror movies aside, is just such an awesome display of what can be done with a low budget, with a small cast in one location, and then he made a film that is by far one of my favourite dark British crime films of the last 10 years. He made Bait. And then he made Attack of the Adult Babies, which is a complete change in tone. Real crazy, balls to the wall, gnarly, out there, crazy horror shit. He's fucking awesome. I love all this guy's work. I love how different it is, how diverse he is, and I love how talented he is. Like I said, I've wanted to have this guy on the show for such a long time. So without further ado, here's my conversation from earlier today with the one and only Dominic Brunt. Boom, and we're live. Dominic Brunn, how you doing, brother? You're good? I'm all right, Theo. Thank you very much. Are you? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine, mate. I really appreciate you doing this. Like, I've been wanting to get you involved in something on Slimehouse for a long time now, so I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Not at all. It's an honour. It's an absolute honour. I love your videos. I love all the Japanese stuff. And me and my son swap and change them and say, have you seen this one? Have you seen this one? So, yeah. It's oh, really? I never knew that. I never knew that. That's That's... <laughs> That's awesome, man. How old is your son? I know I swear a lot on them videos. I always be have to be cautious. Oh, he's all right. I don't mind the swearing. It's it, it, like with videos and that. Like growing up, like, watching the uh, the pre certificate stuff and that. It didn't really damage us. I don't really mind the gore and the swearing. It's it's anything like um, I suppose sexualized and that. I try and keep him away from and that. You've got to protect your kids and that. But the swearing's not too bad. I've caught him swearing badly in front of his kids playing computer games. So I do try and keep an eye on it. And, uh, and making some of the films that we make, I try and keep some of the uh, the material away from and well away, really. Well, because we're both northern as well, like, fuck is every other word when people are talking, do you know what I mean? They're like, I'm, I went to fucking shop and I parked fucking car and it's just normal talk. <laughs> so I'm not a massive swearer. I never really have been. I don't know why. And I, Well, I was a welder. And and uh, and I think, like, I was, I've worked in the same place for about four years. And instead of saying erm, people would swear. And so, uh, so I, I, I don't know why, and it just I think I went the other way for some reason, so I've never been a massive swearer. Like I said, I've wanted to get you on this channel for a long time. I didn't even know that you'd watched any of my videos, so that, I really appreciate that, mate. I, I think I, I met you... I met you once very briefly, but I know we, we've kind of been like in the same circle of people for quite a while, so it's nice yeah. to actually be able to get you up. I remember the first time I met you, I was with Lee Hardcastle, and I'd only met him the day before. Oh, seriously, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I knew of his work a long time, like a long time I'd, I'd followed it. And then I was at Sheffield Film Festival, the celluloid screams that Rob Nevitt runs. Yeah. Shouts to Rob Nevitt every time. And and I met and I met Lee outside. He was just smoking and just chilling. And I and I just and I started talking to him. And I, and I think it was his voice. I said, your voice sounds mega familiar. And he's like, yeah, I'm here because I've got some stop motion in it. And I, in the festival, and I was like, oh, mate, I've watched everything that you ever did. And then the next day I, I met you, but I didn't know... He he never said like oh Dominic Brunt the, the uh, Paddy of Emmerdale is is uh, in in the production. I think he he just called you Dominic Brunt. So when you actually turned up and then you just said like oh does anyone want a drink? Yeah, I literally met you for a second, but I was like why do I know that guy's face? And he's like oh you have known him off Emmerdale because it's not like Emmerdale's not something I grew up watching myself, but it was on in the house. Your your face is like like a part of the fabric of the British homestead. <laughs> It, it's been in so many people's <laughs> lives forever for ages. No, it really, it really has. Because like so many people, when I said about like I were doing this podcast and stuff, 
Uh, and I said, I'm interviewing Dominic Brunt. They're like, oh, I don't know who he is. I goes, he's, he's Paddy off Emmerdale. They're like, what? No way. Like, everyone knows your face. <laughs> it, but you know, no, I think it's funny. It's because you, you kind of live this double life, I suppose, because you, you're this guy that we see on TV in, a, in like one of the most popular soap operas ever. But then you also got this, this little life where you're making crazy horror films on the side, man. So I, I want to talk to you a bit about how that works. Well, I got into acting just because I was into film and into horror films. And uh, I was really lucky that my mate, Lee Whitaker, his dad owned the video shop in Accrington. So we just got, we had, we had access to that. And then we used to make silly little films and things like that. So it was just, it's just, it was just from there really, then going to college and doing that. And then, so it was only through the horror films that I got to do that. I wanted to be a director and it didn't seem, um, it didn't seem obtainable. And then I had a really great acting coach who just said yeah i'll get you in and i'll get you into drama school and all this and i was like really and he, and, and he did you know he was brilliant so that, that was always the trajectory you got into acting because you wanted to eventually get into directing yeah i wanted to yeah yeah but i'm really 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 happy acting now I and mean, i love my job to pieces i love emmerdale you know i'm uh i'm not really ashamed of it or anything like people go like are you really into your horror really you don't you emmerdale's a day job and i was like no i absolutely love emmerdale i love that building i love the place i really do well you've been in it for so long that's going to feel like part of your life now isn't it like that that's going to be like your second family your second home and everything yeah it does feel like that now yeah although i haven't been there for i took five months off about three years ago to go and make a film in america that didn't happen uh, and then, and I've never had enough time. I've never had time off since. And then, uh, and then I just taken, I've just taken three months off because of the coronavirus. So I'm a bit rusty. But I'm going straight back next week to do um, a two hander. Me and Lucy, who plays Chastity, which won't mean anything to you, but it's basically it's two hander. So I've got to learn a 23 minute conversation before next Wednesday. Well, it's mega interesting how that works to me because, I, like, when, whenever I watch like a series or something and then it ends like like your your HBO series or something like that, or your Peaky Blinders or your comedy, Peep Show comedies that I love, British comedy, yeah. Only Fools and that kind of thing. Eventually, the end and like you you always get to the end where you're watching them and then they're finished and you're like, oh shit, man, I don't know what I'm gonna do without my series now. If you're into them soaps, like they never end. You've never got anything to worry about. Yeah, I think uh, like storylines end. They all, you get a storyline and they say this storyline will go on for maybe two months or or the best part of a year or so you do things end but because it's all fragmented i think there's about 56 people in it you, you, try, you know sometimes and then sometimes people die or go missing or leaving a taxi and that's all but yeah I, I think you know there's no there's no riding off in the sunset for everybody it never comes to an end although i have got an ending for emmerdale i think it it should it should it should zoom out in a drone shot at the very very end of it and then you realize there's a big cordon around it and when it zooms out even further and you realize it's set on mars and then there'll be yeah. spaceship landing. I think that'd be an amazing ending. Do, do a, the end. village at the end. It just it pulls out and you're like, yeah. whoa, all along, all this time. Well, I was watching the village and about halfway through, I went, oh, this is um, this is Monty Python. This is um, this is the Holy Grail where they just end up. They're all idiots just dressed up in costumes. And I guessed mm. it from halfway through. I saw it coming a mile off. So he nicked Monty Python and no one saw it. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right there. You're right. I think when, when I watched it, like for the first time, I was pretty young. So I weren't clued up on twists like I am now. Like I'm not watching for him. I, 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 I weren't <laughs> aware that so much stuff in my life was trying to pull the wool over my eyes. I generally just thought I was watching a movie. <laughs> yeah, too nice. So do you know when you when you like originally started acting and you, and you got into the Emma Delphi? I mean, I don't want to uh, dwell on the Emma Delphi stuff too much. But obviously we have to talk about no, it. No, no, it's a big part of your career, isn't it? But like when, when <laughs> yeah. you were, when you first got that job, obviously you wanted to act. You got this job. Did they say like, yeah, you're, you're going to be in this f- forever now? Like, you, I think it was '97 when I looked into it when you were first in it. Like, did they did they let you know, or was it like, no, it's, it's going to be six months and we see how we get no, on? No, like I was a job in actor, so I'd been in all sorts of things like Soldier Soldier and British Empire and uh, EastEnders and all sorts of it. So I'd been in most dramas that were on in them three or four years. I had a really good agent, and then. Um, the and then I was it was supposed to be for eight episodes, so I went along and auditioned with ten other fellas trying to look like farmers and vets, and then uh, I got the call and did it. And then and then I just there was a chap called Norman Bowler that played one of the Frank Tate. It's just come to me. He played Frank Tate, and he said, "Did you enjoy that?" And I went, "I loved it. That was really good." And he said, "Well, go up and see the uh, the producer and tell him that you liked it and tell him that you'd like to stay." So I thought, I never thought of doing that. So I went upstairs and saw Mervyn Watson, who was the producer at the time. And I went, I really, really enjoyed that. If you want me back, I'll, I'll come back. And he went, would you? I was like, you're kidding, are you? Of course I would, yeah. 
So he said, he said, all right, then we'll, we'll write you back in in four months' time. So, and it was as simple as that. I just thought, I didn't, I didn't know that was how it worked. It probably isn't how it worked, but that's how it worked for me. Yeah. That, you did that for a long time. And then, do you know, to make this jump into act, to acting in horror and getting involved in a horror scene yeah. and stuff like that, because you, you, you've gone from from being li- literally just known as, as to, to like the general public as Paddy from Emmerdale, now to being someone who's like a big part of the British horror scene. Like, was that inbred? Was it when you was in Alex Shandon's inbred? Was that the first thing? Yeah, I was a massive horror fan anyway. And we were already doing the Leeds Zombie Film Festival with Mark Charnock, who plays Marlon in Emmerdale. So, um, you was doing that before? I thought that was like a recent thing, like the last no, five years before. you've been doing that. Oh, really? Okay. No, we, okay. We, we stopped it for the last... We, we started off as the Leeds Zombie Film Festival. It was about... I can't remember. That must be 12, 13 years ago we did the first one wow. of them. And uh, and then a new Alex Shandon anyway. That, uh, I can't remember how I got the audition. I think somebody might have said, have you thought of him? So I, I got this weird phone call that came from left field. I would love to remember who said it. I think it was Michael. It's Michael Sanders that runs the farm up there in Thursk. I don't He's know. Got like um, a location up there. He does all the thir- Thursk exploitation stuff, which I love. Anytime there's a farm, they need it. They do it up there. Yeah, yeah, and that's him. So I think he might have mentioned it and said, "Wouldn't it be funny if you got him?" And I already knew Alex Shandon. I had his VHSs and that, you know, and the drill bit Taylor, just brilliant and. Uh, so, so I went for the audition with uh, my VHS copy of Pervarilla, I think. And uh, <laughs> oh, oh no, yeah. I had it was two Pervarilla and um, what's the other one that's in the um, in the house? Pervarilla. Oh, um, uh, Cradle of Fear. Cradle of yeah, Fear. Yeah, with yeah, with Danny Filth. I went with that one. Yeah, and I said, oh, I like said, I'm sorry, I'm really, really nervous. But would you sign me things? It doesn't, you know, if I don't get the job, thanks for seeing me. And he said, oh, right, well, let's just go for a drink. So he went to the pub and talked about his films for an hour and went, right, you can have that job if you want. I was like, yeah. So it was the easiest audition I've ever yeah. had, really. And, yeah. Do you, do you know, and Alex was one of them that I've had. Yeah. And Sorry, then he helped on. you other stuff as well. Now, I, I would just yeah, say that like, Alex is one of them. Sorry, you talk and then I will talk. You're the guest, <laughs> not me. <laughs> It's all right. I think we've got one. You know them weird things that they have on the news when there's that two second delay and people go, no, 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 you go, no, no, sorry, go on. Um, so uh, what what was I saying? What was he said? So he said, oh yeah, yeah. So then I had this idea for uh, I'm running the uh, the Leeds Zombie Film Festival. We got to know Mark Price as well, and uh, who did Colin, and uh, and so between them two, they they, were, they had bags of advice and that, and and I was trying to get mark to director mark said no you should direct it you've always worked to direct it you know you film inside out you've been on a tv set you know what cameras work like so uh so that's how we made the first one really and and then that was ridiculous because that that didn't i think altogether it, it cost we managed to get left films to invest in it so they gave us like 10 grand or something like that which we didn't think we'd be able to do it with but i learned how to edit and uh my wife was in it and we filmed it in our house but it went all over it got um a cinema release here and then Australia and Japan and everything that we got these physical releases in Germany it went mad and so it's a bit weird really so that's that's how we managed to get on into producing more horror films just because of that. What is it? Was that for Before Dawn or is that for Inbred when you said you shot that it? Was before I know that was that, that. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. That, I didn't even get to that yet. I was still talking about the Inbred thing. Oh yeah, yeah well I'm... Inbred. Sorry, yeah. I oh, know. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just, um, so in, oh, no, just, uh... <laughs> sorry. I'm just. I do waffle. I'm sorry. You're gonna have to get a good editor. No, I'm it's a fine. Terrible it's fine. Waffler. Um, <laughs> what was on about inbred oh yeah yeah so i did that was it yeah and he was he, he just got me in it and uh but it was weird because on the first day he said i said what do you want me to do and he said oh there's, a, there's like a dressing up box there and i was late so everybody else was there. well i wasn't late i wasn't in the first scene so everybody else had done their bits and they'd all raided the dressing up box so um so i got the dregs at the bottom so there's only a dress left and a string vest and um and a pair of glasses that were broken so i just put all them on and he went oh i love it i love it i love it so that's how it ended up with a dress on and some broken glasses for the character, just because that's all that was left. That's wicked, because it's quite an iconic look now. I know that that's your profile picture, isn't it? And I couldn't really see you in any other get up now in that film. <laughs> <laughs> it was such good fun, I can't tell you. Because I always thought it was going to be really, really stressful, but they were just having a big old laugh, you know, and they were out every night and into Thirsk and they knew all the pubs and things like that. So it was a really, really sociable job. Whereas I think the ones I've done, they've, they've always been like, I think especially being an actor on something, you're all right, because when it finishes, it finishes. But for everybody else, there's behind the scenes trying to prepare for the next day. But I absolutely loved it. I thought it was super. And I love the film. You know, working with Joanne Hartley was just ace as well. And meeting Seamus again. Seamus had a bit on Emmerdale and 
um, yeah, I think most jobs you do, you come across someone that's done a day or two on Emmerdale, so it's it's quite a, yeah. It's even a even people in my people. film I know, and they, they played a paramedic or, or something on in a in a scene <laughs> yeah, in, in Emmerdale, it, yeah, or things like that. <laughs> no, it's, it's it must be like that that little like stamper approval you need. Yeah, yeah, I think it happens because I, th- I think if you act in London, it was always the bill because uh, I did one episode of the bill, so it's one of the things of did you do the bill? Well, of course I did the bill, you know. And I think in Yorkshire, it's like, have you done <laughs> the bill yet? And, you know. <laughs> Well, what I was saying about the, the Alex Shandon thing is like I, he's he's one of them I've never actually met him. But when when oh, you did Inbred, I, I watch. Well, I, I, this is what I think. When when you did Inbred, I, w- I watched the trailer for it, and at the time I was making a big documentary about graffiti. Yeah. Uh, that Sheffield is the graffiti capital of Europe in the nineties. It, it, like it was called the Sheffield Graffiti Kingdom. It was like notorious for it. So I made this big documentary, yeah. and at the time he'd filmed all these like abandoned trains, and some of the guys that had graffitied him were people in my documentary. So I just hit him oh, up amazing, randomly. Yeah. I just hit him up randomly and was like, oh, I'm not trying to jump on your locations or nothing, but some of the guys I'm interviewing, that's their work. Could you let me know what location is? Maybe I could go film some for this doc. And straight away, we're like, yeah, this is it. Like, this was just over Facebook, like, really responsive. And in a day and age where so many people just, like, ignore you. Like, yeah, he just he just got straight back. And then when I interviewed Emily Booth at Horicon, she had nothing but good words to say about Alex Shandon either. She said about Perverella, and she's like, yeah, that, that, he, he pretty much gave me my first job and got me on the horror thing that, that, that now is like her bread and butter. Yeah, I think that's true. I read somewhere that I think it was a brother with something to do with it. I think a brother was producing it and he said, Oh, I need someone to do this and it's willing to, you know, dress like this, if you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah. And yeah, um, yeah. and he said and, Which and is mad to say it's a brother, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's it. I think I can't remember his name. I've met I think he did a short film called Selkie as well recently. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah, he did they did yeah. do Selkie together, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he and he said, "Well, I think my sister might do that," <laughs> which is amazing. But yeah, and that's led to a, a career. You know, it must be like thirty-year-old career because yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Doing out there and uh, and uh, the shock movie massacre, and she's interviewed everyone. Like she was a really good person to talk to. But again, I had nothing but good words to say about Alex Shandon. Yes. So you've pretty much gone from now, like being full time actor, which you're still doing full time actor, but then directing. And, and and myself, I've done a little bit of acting and, and quite a bit of directing and stuff. I, I prefer yeah. stress wise acting all day. Acting is so much less stressful, and you just point, you just you just like uh, tipped on a little bit. You, you pointed that out a little bit. Then I just wanted to ask you about how you feel about the difference between acting and directing and what, what stresses you more and what's more enjoyable in the long run. I don't know. I think you can, I think if you fail with acting, then there's a lot of people to see you fail. Um, and, and you can't change it afterwards. Whereas I think directing, well, I do anyway, I try and plan it as much as I can until I'm, until I'm become kind of obsessed and sleepless with it and try and live the film or the short as much as I can and yeah. pick my shots and, and then feel guilty about them shots and then, you know, oh God, it's not. So I was trying to over prepare for it. And then you've still got, you know, you've got your edit, haven't you? You've got your sound that you can get away with. You've got your choice of shots. And I don't know, I, I, I quite like the pace of directing. The three week shoot is always a, an absolute scramble and that. And there's never enough time. I remember somebody putting a limpet on the car. Um, to get a side shot through the window with this, uh, what they call polarizing lens. And he, he, as he was doing it, he said, I never met him before. And I've met a load of uh, g- uh, grips. And he said, Time, I, <laughs> they say, I'm not your enemy. Time's your enemy. And I was thinking, well, you're weird. And then about half an hour, yeah. and he's still doing it. I was going, what are you doing? I've got to get these shots. And he went, what did I say? Yeah. I'm not your <laughs> enemy. Time's your enemy. And I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Like, you know. And <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I think I, um, I mean, obviously, I, I prefer acting, and that's what that's what I was trained to do. And uh, but directing was only meant to be kind of um, a, a hobby, really, and to try and get it was a way of getting around the fact that we only had ten grand to make the film. But you know, I I, I hit it professionally. I wasn't I wasn't going to do it halfway, and you know, I was still obsessed with trying to get the right shots and trying to get it right and develop shots into bits and read bits and bats and watch my favorite films and. You know, but uh, I feel more comfortable in acting, I think. Well, it flows perfect. I, I I watched it again before dawn, before we did this, because I saw it when it came out, and then I watched it again, and it, it still flows perfect. It was funny because when you when that dropped, like word was like within the horror community, which I'm not like fully in, because I I do mm. I, I'm more in the toy community and stuff like that. But like when it yeah. and, and actual, actual like filmmaking, I kind of just do my own thing with it. But through HorrorCon and then other people I know that are into horror and stuff, that the word like on the street was that 
Dominic Brun, Paddy from Emmerdale, has made this movie and he borrowed all the cameras from from Emmerdale and and <laughs> shot it at his house, which I, I I don't think that was the case, was it? There, no. I thought you would like, like the modern day Fred Williamson when he did like Black <laughs> no. Hover and stuff in Italy. He'd be out there shooting a movie and then he'd borrow all the equipment from the film and on the weekend shoot his own thing. So that was the <laughs> that was the rumor at the time is that you'd borrowed the Emmerdale cameras and made this zombie movie. No. No, 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 at all. It was Mark Price that brought it all along and that, but um, like the other ones when because I think with Before Dawn, I still like it. I saw it the other day, but it's it's still it's all handheld cameras and um which is all right. You can put your edit in anywhere and that and it seems to work as long as your sound's fine and you know work spent a lot of time on the sound. But then when it got to doing uh bait, that was when we kind of got the cat the, the correct stuff and dollies and um proper rigs and sliders and everything so every scene was more considered and still uh, and i didn't want to shake it i think when there was a fight we had a, an over the shoulder camera and that was it really but um so it, it was what you can do at the time with 10 grand really yeah, and, yeah. and uh but uh i mean 10 grand's still a lot of money in it when it's not yours and you've got I, I wish i had 10 grand to make a movie like when i made my yeah. film unit 11 like it was all out of my own pocket which is why it took so long and when oh, we've we seen it it's amazing how did you do what, that i mean it's did you watch it i did that's, did, that's, yeah. i didn't know i never knew you'd watched it yeah no i it was literally paid for out my own pocket i watch anything oh nice one <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it's such an achievement. Yeah. Thank you, dude. Well, yeah, that that was literally all handheld cameras because at the time, like the only steady cam you could get was like a glide cam, and then the one yeah. up from that was like the big expensive one that connects to your chest. And we're like breaking into abandoned locations and like sneaking a massive <laughs> minigun in. Like, so it was either can we take the minigun or can we try and get a steady cam? Okay, we'll take the minigun. And yeah, it was it was all <laughs> handheld and. And and, it takes and also for at the time, that though. It's brilliant. Oh, thank you, bro. It was it was literally like like you were saying, like you've got to live and breathe it for for almost ten years. Literally, yeah. I sat and thought and like slept every night, three three hours tossing and turning <laughs> because I was just thinking about how am I going to get this film finished. The fact it is finished is a complete miracle. Well, I have to say it because the uh, the amount of people that, that um uh, I spoke to a cameraman once and he said that um the the theory was with the, the is it the Canon five Ds and the seven Ds. He said this is going to completely demo- no. I said that this is going to completely democratize filmmaking, and this means that anybody that wanted to make a film has no excuse, and they're going to make a film. And he said yeah, it won't yeah. happen. It won't happen because you've still got to have the stories, and you've got to have the skills, and there's a physics to filmmaking. You know, there's the crossing the line, and you still got to develop it. And he said people are lazy. And he said the, the directors that you know that are still talking about making a film in five years' time, they'll still be talking about it. It's nothing to do with that. It's having the the impetus and that feel of I've got to get start here and end here and and it is and yeah. and, and it, there's there's a few people who've got it and you know and that's it but it's it's really hard work isn't it you know but if you like oh, it you like yeah, it yeah you know, it's and, ridiculous and, and at the it time takes we, nerds. No, it does. It takes so you have, like you said, you've got to be. It's not even borderline obsessed. You have to literally live and breathe it because yeah. otherwise, it would just never get finished. I, I, I've done it where I've, I've been up for like pretty much three days drinking cans of Monster, editing this thing, and I'm just like, <laughs> th- th- there is no other way this would get finished. I have no yeah. idea how anything gets made. Like, like yeah. I said, we we had we had we had z- zero money. I wouldn't have to talk about my film, but just because of the comparison you were saying no, about no, the handheld no. filmmaking, that kind yeah, of thing. lovely. I, I was I was yeah. like just so so obsessed with I, I I mean now I've got to a point where I've realised it doesn't really matter what you shoot your full film on it's how you shoot it but at the time I was very yeah. cautious that if you didn't if if I if I lingered on a shot for too long it started looking shot on video and I'd been to loads yeah. of film festivals where a movie starts and it's shot on video and within first thirty seconds you can see and it takes you out of it because you're like okay I'm watching a shot on video movie now and I never wanted that. Oh, yeah. I mean, we didn't have a we didn't have a proper script or anything. We used to just make the script up as we were going. It never we never <laughs> even intended it on being a proper film. We just made it for fun for the first five years, and then for the next five years, thought let's try and actually do something with it. So, <laughs> but but you, you but you understand the, the struggle. But what you did what was really clever is that you made your move first movie in one location with like three cast. I made mine in fifty locations with hundred and fifty <laughs> cast, and that's why it stressed me so much. So so the next know, thing I want to make a lot more shrunk down. I'm gonna take a leaf out of your book because yeah, like just going back. <laughs> before dawn before we talk about bait but before dawn fl- flows perfect yeah. and it not it never comes across as corny or cheesy you didn't try and go for like loads of cheap laughs to be like okay well we've we've not got a big budget so we'll go for more schlocky stuff you didn't do anything like that it's a it's a depressing grim film it's like to me it's on yeah. par with something like like threads do you know in in, in, uh, in terms of tone oh, it's yeah 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 it's shot in sheffield man so my my hometown. Yeah, Reece, so yeah, I've always had Reece, love for that. Uh, Reese Dinsdale was in Threads and that. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah Wicked. So that's the tone it gives, and then and then so 
You did that first film, which is like, uh, and you can watch that now on Amazon Prime. That's where I rewatched it yesterday. You can, anyone that wants to watch it before dawn on Amazon Prime, you can watch Dominic Brunt's first movie, and it's it's an astounding achievement. And then you you did Bait. Uh, and I and I love Bait. I've watched Bait lots lots of times, which is ca- kind of a change in tone in terms of it's less horror and it's more like on some Death Wish kind of like grim street level revenge kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think um, like there's there's definitely um, there's a there's a thread that goes through what we do with um, you know like you you've, you've got to tell a story with an art, but at the end of it, because I'm well into my special effects and that, there's always like a, a climax at the end. So. Uh, it was all, Bait was always filmed in the same manner as I suppose Adult Babies as well, with the the culmination of the the shit cannons at the end of Adult Babies and um, the big massacre at the end of uh, Before Dawn. I suppose you've just got to you, you're paying the audience to watch this uh, and invest this time in this story, and then their little prize at the end is this. Um, climatic finish with the best special effects that you can that you can throw at it. Oh yeah, so yeah. I think that's what we did with Bait as well. That, it was supposed to be that the, the loan shark was a, a monster that it could have been Dracula or the mummy or any anything or a ghost or a demon, you know, but it wasn't. It was a loan shark. That was his monster. Uh, and he was completely dehumanized and he was, um, you know, a, a, a sociopath. So we got like, um, a, there was a psychologist chap around here called Norman. I can't remember his name now. And it, we were desperate not to have the, the usual Cockney gangster. Um, we had to have a psychology behind it. And so we had to get the psychologist with this lad that I'd, I'd been to college with years and years before. But he'd spent 10 years at the RSC and Jonathan Slinger. And I knew, you know, seen him play Hamlet and Macbeth at the RSC. And I was like, if we could get him, I know he wouldn't just throw it away. He wouldn't just give us this Cockney thing. You know, he'd really, really go into it. And he did, you know, he really put the effort in. So yeah, yeah. that was, the, that was the, the thought behind that, that then you get this straight story about this sociopath and that, but, with the analogy of a monster and then at the end you know the payoff is that anybody who's wanted to sit through it gets to see somebody's head smashed in. <laughs> yeah yeah i, di- I didn't want to like give away any spoilers but like that that whole movie you, you're watching it and it's uh, and it's not an effects heavy movie it's it's brutal it's and it's, it's gnarly and yeah and and, it, and it's very like unforgiving and stuff but then it, and it is violent and there's like a lot of slapping and there's a lot of like horrible like mistreating and stuff and, and a bit of drowning and things like that but then when, when that happens at the end and some and there's someone in the film they they get what happens to him. I remember watching it for the first time and I was like, fuck, what the fuck? And it's rare because I, I don't, I, I, I've watched, I, I'm like you, I was raised on this stuff. I was buying VHS from yeah. the car boot when I was like seven. Yeah, so I've watched yeah, everything yeah. all my life. It's it's rare that I watch a movie anymore and like something happens and you're like, oh, fuck, do you know what I mean? But when that happens and you actually see what he's done to him, because the, the film is like, it's not effects heavy. So so then when we see, to what we see at the end, he's so effects heavy that it's like, yeah. it throws you off. And I think that was a real clever way to do it. It, you don't expect it at all. I think if you if you do like when you're in adult babies, which we'll talk about after, like we've um, that that's got quite a few crazy effects going on through it. So by yeah. the time at the end of it, when you see something crazy, you're like, oh yeah, another cool effect. But when it happens in bait, because yeah. you've not seen anything like it until the end, it completely catches you off guard. It's a bit like in um, yeah. in Breaking Bad when you see when you see Gus Free. Do you know Breaking Bad when you see what happens to Gus Free in that in Breaking Bad? I've got the box set and I, I still haven't watched it because my wife's watched it all the way through. So I was like, all I'll right. get to it, I'll get to it. But no, I haven't seen it. Oh. Well, I won't ruin it. But there's a part when you see something with with, with Gus in that and, and it's like, shit, man, because you just didn't expect it. So it was definitely <laughs> one of those moments. And, I, and I'll always say to people, watch this. When they say, like, oh, what's like a good like British crime one? I go, I bet you've not seen this one. Watch Bait. And it's got a rape right <laughs> payoff at the end. And that's got Leon Castle in it as well, hasn't he? He's, in, he's got his little... He's in uh, yeah, well, he started going. There, yeah? He started going to acting lessons and that. So um, we said, I think we worked with him twice. He was in a short film called Sybil that we did as well. It's on. Uh, is it called Alter on uh, YouTube, which is like short film showcase? Yeah, I've seen uh, it. Yeah, yeah, and he, he did yeah. that. He was, he was. Uh, uh, so he, he's, um, and he's a, he's a mate, you know. And then when he said, "I'm, I'm going to get into acting. I really fancy it." I was like, "Oh, you've got to do it. You've got to do it. It's an amazing thing to do." Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we'd always get him in. We'd always try to find something with him. That, but yeah, going back well, to the you, you shared us. It, it was. It was oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're good. no, no, it's all right. It was. We purposely the first time somebody was beaten, they were thrown behind. You could they get blocked with um, a pool table so that you don't see what's happening, and then you slowly yeah. try and open up and show a bit more, and show a bit more than a bit of an effect, and like the, the old woman being beaten and dragged. We take a um, dog. 
you know, yeah, you just open it up and open it up so that then when you're there, you're like, ah, now look at this, you know. So it was kind yeah, of purposeful, yeah. that. But I know what you mean, yeah. If you if you've thrown all your all your bits in to one, then you've had it, then haven't you? Because people are going now, what next? And if you go down, the yeah, floor, yeah, you've you've got to constantly, you've got nowhere to go. If you show yeah. something really good too early, then you've you can only go more, which That's and which it. is more difficult. So I think, yeah, you, you put all your eggs into one basket at the end, and I really do think it works. Yeah. Uh, just just back to the Lee Yardcastle thing because he does a little bit of animation in that at the end. Yeah. Uh, when I I was with him, we was filming the g- gunship video. He did a, a video for the eighties synth, like eighties style synth with band Gunship, yeah. and I, I shot that. I yeah. shot that with him. He used loads of my VHS in it, and we, uh, his studio at the time, you was both sharing a studio together, like an office space. Yeah, we were. Yeah, that, that, in the middle of Leeds. Yeah. yeah, I think it didn't have any windows, which is fine if you're writing and that. And uh, and I come and go, and it's only down. It's next door to Emmerdale, so I'm still there. I've had it for about eleven years. That place, it's good, so I can write there and store all my stuff there. I've got all my textbooks there, and I learn my lines there, and do all this, that, and the other. And but, um, but I think for Lee, he was all right there for a couple of years. But then having no windows and nobody coming by, he was like, "I'm gonna go." Know. So he moved yeah, it into yeah. his spare bedroom where he's got a window. And because what he does, I mean, it, you'd sit there and you'd sit there, and the be, it, it looks like he's doing loads and loads and loads of stuff. And he goes, "I've done this really cool thing today. Do you want to see it?" And he'll press play. And it will be seven seconds worth of stuff, and he spent all day doing it. And you're like, "You're insane! You're insane! You know yeah. how can you do it?" But he's really, and he he loves it. It's like this meditative thing, and he's a he's a really calm, considered, and intelligent lad, and he's 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 literate, and and I think that's that thing of living in your head and just uh, being patient. Because I wouldn't, because it'd be on the floor within a, a day or two, I think, if I had to do it. Yeah, I mean, anyone that's listening that doesn't know who Lee Castle is, he's an amazing stop motion animator. And like, when I interviewed him on the very first, the very first series that anything we ever did for Slime House was on was on TV. We did it on Sheffield Live, and, and I interviewed him in episode two. Uh, and he said that he spends so much time on his own that he's like, you, you lose your rhythm, you forget how to talk to people. And I never really yeah. understood that until I, I started working for myself from home all the time. And then like my girlfriend had come round and she's like, feel like you're talking so quick, like you're firing hundred things at me. And I goes, you know what? I've just been on my own for like three days. I've got so much to say i've got so much to talk you, you can't and i can imagine if i was like that for, for weeks like he does you, you do you do lose your rhythm but but the payoff is the work that he does is incredible i remember i read yeah. ray harryhausen's book when i was like 12 and he said the same thing you've got to spend so long on your own that like you, you kind of yeah. do get in your in your own in your own world doing that stuff yeah, but that, did, that is did ray the payoff do it on his own i can't remember if he, did he have like everything. a studio with people working in it or did he do everything on his own no pretty much all i mean his dad used to build him his armatures even right up to the very end i went i actually Wow. went to meet Ray Harryhausen. I met him like three years kidding? before he died. No, well, maybe a bit bit before that. When I was like wow. 18, 17, I went to meet him. Yeah, in London, he was doing a thing. And at the time, him? yeah, I met him. I got my picture with him on, on the wall here. But I, I was only, I think I was 18. And, and at the time, he was doing a sign in at Forbidden Planet. There was probably 10 people stood in the queue. So this is even, <sighs> even now, He's I think he's like even more respected now that he's not here than he even was then. Yeah, but uh, I, I've got I a mad, that, yeah. it's a mad story. Because when I went to meet him, I was stood in the queue. And then some guy walks in and like kind of pushed to the front of the queue. And there's a couple of people like, oh, who's that kind of thing? Dude with a big suit on, blue, dark blue suit, glasses, gray hair, gray beard. It was John Landis. John Landis had just turned up randomly to get his book signed. And I went, shit, man, is that John Landis? And someone else were like, oh, yeah. And then someone at the front were like, why are you here? And he goes, what do you mean, why am I here? It's Ray fucking Harryhausen. I'm getting my book signed. <laughs> so it was it was literally going there to get his book signed and say hello to him because he knew he was in, yeah. he was in, the, in the area. Like, that's how fucking much of a dude this guy was. So, yeah. Just was he nice? Stop motion it? anime. He was, I mean, he was so nice, but he was so yeah. old that he, his hearing had gone. Like, I, oh. and, I, and I said to him, I said, oh, can you sign my book to Theo? And he goes, oh, like Theodopolis, of course. And he, yeah, he was, he was lovely, man. And, it, and like, nobody was having pictures back then. It was before selfies and stuff. And I, yeah, I took yeah. a digital camera and, and, and he shook my hand on camera and got me to take a picture and stuff. So oh, it was yeah. like one of those moments you'll never get ever again. And I weren't, yeah. I weren't just fanboying. Like, I genuinely idolized this dude. For, I, I wanted to do stop motion for many years. As I grew up wanting to just do special effects. That was the only yeah. thing I wanted to do. To do and then as I got more into directing that kind of took a back seat and I still did all my own special effects for unit 11 and things but it's yeah. um yeah it's he's he's the guy man everyone's inspired by this guy in some way even if it's just his mentality yeah, yeah. Sat in the dark like room said, for hours making stuff and even special effects people and anybody anybody that's into horror and like you said I think more people talk about him now than they ever did when he was alive yeah yeah 
So I and so the stop motion thing, you you added a little bit of that at the end of it. If you if you stick around till after the credits, you see it an extra little bit because I suppose we, we kind of take the impression at the end of it that these two chicks might actually go off and and have a sequel or, or do some other stuff or, or go on other ad other like not adventures but kind of like clearing up scumbags in in the north of England. Is that what yeah, we get? Is I don't that what really you like? Want? I've never liked uh, um, sequels, and I, I don't even now when you speak to people and they're writing things and they go, yeah, but because uh, people really need content, so we're going to leave it all open. And I, I don't know. I like a beginning, middle, and an end, and I yeah. don't care if everybody dies at the end of it. You know, that's the end of that story. I don't believe in keeping it open just in case. You know, somebody might. Oh, I love a sequel. sequel. Oh, I'd love to like see it. them turn no, up I again. Like yeah, no, I, I, I'd love to see them turn up again and cross over and all that shit. Because I, I, I go up on comic books and stuff so much. I love a good crossover and a sequel and all that kind of shit. So that, that that's a shame, but I, I, I rate your integrity with that, man, that, that even though you left it. Because you do kind of leave it a little bit open, don't you, at the end, when they put the guy's hand in a, in a, in a toasty or so It's like a toasty grill, like a George yeah, Foreman. We did, we, gets... Yeah, we did talk about them that, doing that, that. Then they turn out as bad as them, but I don't know if you could spin that out for an hour and a half. I think... I like the I like the the uh, the kernel of the idea that went through and then that ends there, you know. Same as before, don't somebody said, "What well, what would you do as sequel to that?" And maybe concentrate on another family, and you're like, "No, they're, they're, they're both the dead, you know." And what what do you want? The zombies? What do you want? They cook together and bring up kids, yeah. zombie kids. It's it's rubbish. You know, well, so you know what? Like... I, do you know why I loved before dawn as well? Because like. I mean, nothing actually starts to happen zombie-wise until like a good hour into it or something. But I think you're so invested in the story that you're like, do you know what? If no zombies turn up, I don't even mind. I'm just interested in how these two are going to work out this issue that they've got. Like, I, I think that's really good writing and that probably comes from the, the, the side of you doing soaps and stuff and, and getting that familiarity with drama. But I think that trick of every five minutes making sure there's a drip of something like the screams, the hear something in the background, there's a shout in the background, so that's the start of it, but it's way in the distance. Yeah. And then yeah. it, it's like things keep happening nearer and nearer and nearer to home. And then, you know, um, I think drive past a car with blood on the front, but they can't see it. And then there's something that gets her on the run and then there's something in the garage and it's in the house. So it's it's bringing the threat nearer and nearer and nearer and nearer until they're screaming in each other's faces. And so that that was the that was the thing with that. And, and it was supposed to be that... See, the problem is with marketing, you can say, well we'd love to trick people and people put it on and you think this is a film about um, a couple and the disintegration of their marriage, but we throw zombies at them da-da, as a surprise, but you've no chance because like Metrodome that sold it, um, distributed it in this country, you know, he said, well, I've, I've got to sell a zombie film. And you're like, yeah, but look at the front cover. You've got a million zombies in it. There's about three zombies in it. And he went, yeah, listen, do you want to sell this film or not? I was like, well, I want people to see it. And he's like, right, we'll leave it with us then. And you're like, all right, okay. You know, so um, it's impossible to surprise anybody with that. But, you know, there is a there is a little uh, trickle all the way through. To, I think it's 25 minutes before any zombies turn up, but you hear them and you, you see things going on and that. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's setting up. So it's, I think anybody, anybody that watches a film will invest 20 to 25 minutes in being told a story and then if you don't come out with the goods after that you've had it you, the, you've lost them so that was the the experiment of just saying sit back let's have the let's have the nerve to tell this story very carefully about this couple and then throw the kitchen sink at them you know and do you know because obviously we're working on emmerdale for so long did you get like really familiar with how to use cameras and recording sound and directing and that kind of thing that surely would have been like your film school in lots of ways no, I didn't. Uh, well, anybody that we've hired, especially from even before dawn, even though it was handheld, we we didn't get anybody from the cameras from there because there's certain rules with with soap and drama and TV where you've got your wide and your mid and then your two shot and there might be an establishing master shot that's a little bit different. But you know that's the rules and you'll see it. You know and uh, and others variations on that. But film isn't anything to do with soap and and so. Although we had schedulers that could schedule a, a really, really well for us and uh, the sound people, because they're used to working at a certain speed with sound, and sound is sound, you know, and it's really important, but it's important to get it right if you're working at a certain speed. But it's quite insistent that the editors and the cameramen uh, and the grips and the lighting were nothing to do with uh, the television side. They all came from cinema, you know, with like Jeff Boyle who'd done all sorts of stuff and he runs yeah, cinematography.org. Yeah. So I, I don't mind anything, any other, you know, even costume and all that but special effects and camera have got to be filmed because you're filming it completely differently and on all your choice of shots you would never see on emmerdale or any of the continuing dramas i don't think you know i think it's a different um it's a different discipline altogether. so when you was doing do, um before dawn that was that like literally like your film school your first in your first attempt to actually like directing something did, did you do any like 
I know you said like you did some stuff before as a kid, like you were messing about with cameras and things, but in, in terms of like making an, an actual movie, was that your film school or have you done some kind of training before? No, that was it really. I did. I didn't. Um, we were trying to get this short off the ground, and and um, uh, what's he called? Mark Price said, "Why are you doing that?" And he said, "You'll take you three or four days to get it done, and and you might as well keep everybody in your house for two weeks and do your feature." And I was like, "I don't think I'm ready for a feature," so uh, he just said, "Make sure you do." I always have these big notepads, and I write down each scene separately and do my camera plans from below, so I know. There's, the actors move from there to there and while well, the camera moves from there to there, you know, and follow the rules. If the actors are still, keep the camera moving. If the actors are moving, keep the camera still and, you know, frame it right and develop it. And, you know, I was just trying to, I just, I made sure I had my notebooks full of stuff. So I was ready, but uh, it was definitely, it was definitely jumping in at the deep end. But still, you know, watch it now and it annoys me that I wasn't, you know, why didn't I put that down on a set of sticks? You know, why is that moving there? You know, why is it moving so much? Um, but you're you know, always going to pick apart away. everything you do. Any kind of artist everything. is the same, isn't it? Yeah, you're always yeah. going to pick apart everything. I'd, I'd draw something, and within a week, I think it's the worst thing in the world, and I don't even know what <laughs> I was thinking. But when you, because when you, well, when you did before Dawn and then Bait, if, I mean, Bait's got a bigger cast, but it's still shorter. When we get to Attack of the Adult Babies, that's got like a yeah. huge cast, so that must have been like a completely like jumping in at the deep end for you. Yeah, we had we had more money then. So um, before uh, Metrodome that distributed before Dawn paid for Bait. Um, and then after that, because that had done all right, I was so I was, the, the story is so I took five months off from Emmerdale. I was taken on by uh, Radar Pictures that did Jumanji and all that, and um, oh wow, uh, to do uh, a six million dollar film in Puerto Rico, uh, and I had to go out and do all this. So I took the five months off. I was over the moon, you know. I'd already been to Hollywood and they'd showed me around, and you know, I met um, Ted Field that runs it and. It was just incredible, you know. It's like, oh my god, I can't believe it. And it's only because he'd seen bait and loved it. And it was like you said about the effects at the end. He was like, I don't know how you did it. I keep watching it. And how you did it? Tell me how you did it. Blah blah blah. I signed the contract. I was into it. I was going to get the Directors Guild of America. All this, all these doors open. And I was thinking, oh my god, this is insane. This sort of stuff doesn't happen. The and dream, then a yeah. few weeks before, uh, somebody, uh, one of the cast was changed. It brought another cast member. I'd love to tell you names and things like that. I just can't, you know. Yeah, no, I get it. Um, you don't have to. <laughs> and, so, and then they they changed one of the cast members. The cast member wanted to make, to make changes then to the script. Uh, the original script writers were no longer attached to it. Then You know, like, for some reason, they write the original thing, then the producers take it away and screw it all away. They weren't happy with it. Uh, it was going to be changed again, so they had to get the directors, no, the writing guild of America involved. And then and then in the end, Ted Field just turned around and said, look, we're going to have to postpone this. This has turned into a mess before we even started. Let's put it back. And I was like, I can't put it back. I've got a, I've got a full-time job here. I've taken this mm. five months off. We have to do it now, and he said, "We can't do it now. We we can't. This is we can't. This is going to be lawyers. It's going to be time." And there was already a producer out there getting all the um, the accommodation booked, and I'd had all the locations, pictures, and things like that. And I was go, "Oh, it's just it was just it was so upsetting at the time." And all these doors shut again. And then I went to uh, I was in a mood. I was doing up an old Land Rover with my time instead, and uh, we were supposed to go for this dinner. And my wife said, "Let's go." And I was like, "I don't want to see anybody. I'm going to have to explain why I'm at home again when I." You know, I wasn't really bragging about it, but people knew I was going to America to do this thing. You know, it was interesting. So people knew. So I was like, I don't want to go. And, and so I went out and then uh, met this producer. And he said, well, why don't you do that Attack of the Adult Babies? And I was like, well, look, how am I going to get the money for that at this short notice? If I'd have known America was going to uh, be cancelled, I'd have gone for the money for that. And he went, look, on that title, I'll give you the money. As long as I get the money back, I'm happy. But I'm pretty sure I can sell it with that title. So I was like, oh, my God, right, okay. So that's how that happened. And he said, is there a script? And I went, is there a script? Of course there's a script. And then ran home and went, Jesus Christ, we haven't written the script yet. Oh, my God. You know, it was only a title. And um, uh, uh, there was like a treatment for it, like five-page treatment. So um, so that's what how that happened. It was a bit – so there's a lot of anger involved in it and a lot of frustration, and but then a lot of relief that, I, you know, I managed to get a bit more work and I was doing something apart from doing up a Land Rover for five months. So. So yeah, that was a product of, of one one project getting cancelled. It was you would have yeah. never had Attack of the Adult Babies otherwise. Yeah, no, it wouldn't have been made. I don't think it might have been made. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I was amazed that it was like a. I had it written on my wall in the office in Leeds for ages, just because I really loved the title. I was like, this is, this is a title. You know, it's the Revenge of the Adult Babies. You know, and I was just like, I would love a film that was about that. And then, 
Uh, and so, yeah, that's how it came to be. And, and unfortunately, the, the chap that put the money in was nothing to do with it. He said, you crack on, you know what you're doing. So that's how we ended up with all the animation in, all the, the story and all the things. You know, it wasn't formulaic because he didn't insist on a love story going through it and, you know, temper this bit and you can't do that. And so that's why it's pretty, it's it's of its own sort of thing because there's nobody breathing down our necks. I don't know how happy he is with it or anything, but it's made now, you know. Well, yeah, the, it's a complete twist in tone from your other work because your other stuff is pretty grim and, and and pretty serious, pretty realistic, yeah. and and very like, but very probably like a lot more down to earth than than than. I mean, I don't know one's got zombies in, but it's still very like very bleak and and it's, it feels very gritty. Whereas th- this is like a complete change in tone. This is this is like literally something you'd find on a VHS from from the eighties. It's like what the fuck, some Henning lot kind of kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd ever make anything like it again. It was just a release of this. You know, it, it, my whole life was going to change, and then it didn't, you know. And then, uh, so I, I think a lot of that went into it. But I, I don't think I'd make something like that again. Because even like we've got, I'm sure you have as well. You've got like folders of stories and scripts and half finished scripts and treatments and things like yeah, that. Yeah. And and they're all kind of along that line of uh, the concept of um, uh, social realism. And then you throw something horrific and unnatural at that very normal situation. And, mm. They're all along them lines, and and they are quite pole faced, and but then with uh, horrific effects they're on it as well. But uh, so that that it, yeah, I don't think I would have made it maybe, and uh, I don't think I would make it now either. But I'm proud of it. I'm really really proud of it. We've got the poster as you come out of the loo here. I'm like a wicked yes, poster. I made a, film, I made a film called Attack of the Adult Babies. It's out there and it exists. I'm proud, you know. <laughs> yeah, and that, so you had what like. Because you'd already been out to America to get this film sorted, it didn't happen. So you had five in that yeah. five months. You basically got all your cast, your everything together, your locations, your effects, everything, and shot it all within that time. Yeah, it was uh, it was about twelve weeks actually. Yeah, and then we had a bit more time for post production, but uh, it was. I mean, I I've, we've never had a line producer or a producer. We've always had um, the same people. Actually, be, be, my mate Bob. Farrell did the line producing, but it's usually me and Joe, my wife, who writes all the ideas. Uh, Joe Mitchell, and she's uh, so, and and it's usually like a very much a, a, as a couple we make them, and it, it just it, it was much more fun with just having a line producer it's called Carl Hall, and he could just run at it and do it, and so Joe could Joe was helped doing the producing, and yeah. it meant that I could concentrate on directing and it was just i'll never work i'll never go back to the old way of working i'll always have a line producer because there's so much you know it's it's terrifying it's just ter- and also you've got to you've got to firefight and you've got to work all the stuff out and all the legal stuff and the accounts and things like that and then apply for this and that and uh contracts and i, I just hate it you know i really do i didn't know how much i, no, I, I do we that, that's do the side of filmmaking i hate and the stuff that stresses me and keeps me awake at night is, is all the organizing yeah. of everything that's not the art yeah, yeah, I think that's right. You know, because even then, like before done, you think, well, we just made it, and then and then we we passed it around, and then but then it gets to someone. They say, right, here's your list of deliverables. You've got to sign this. You've got to do for this. You've got to do that. You've got to get what's your errors and emissions. You've got to get your uh, your insurance. You've got to get, you know, have you got? Is it called an M and E track? So they need the film with all the vocals taken out, but with all the sound in. You've got to go and re-record. So that. they can read it and stuff like that. Oh yeah, are, are all your, your are your sounds legal? You know, is everything. And, you, and you're signing it just thinking, fuck, I just wanted to make a film. You know, this is terrifying. So yeah, no matter yeah. how much fun it is to do it, you, they'll get you in the end. You know, whoever's distributing, they want their backs covered and you've got to make sure it's all above board. And, you know, even even the story, is it, was this influenced by something else? Is there something we need to know that's not there? And it's just, you've just got to, there's a really good book called um, The Real Deal, but it's R-E-E-L Deal. And that's about, it goes right from making films with mates and saying, I know you're making your film with mates, but just make sure this is this. And if you're going to have a phone call about something important, put the phone down, do it over an email. You've got it in writing then, you know, cover everybody's back because, uh, you know, it can it can be serious. It's it's really, really frightening. No, it, it's, it sounds like a book I'd like to read, definitely. Like, cause yeah, that, that's all the stuff that's alien to me. I literally come from the world of grabbing my camera with mates and doing it. Obviously, all, yeah. all sound, sound effects and stuff are always like we've made them ourselves, the legal and yeah. sound sets. Um, soundtrack and everything but i know what you mean there's all there's probably lots of little things that you don't think about moving forward on on the next project yeah well even i think uh we did something where we got some some song and it was supposed to be in the public domain and then we found that it wasn't so we paid it was only like 15 quid and there was about a three second 
um, it was uh, something Joe was doing. And so she paid it and then got the paperwork and signed it and sent it off. And then she, it was only recently she got a, an email through saying, um, we're, we're chasing you for a breach of copyright for this song. So she's just got the paperwork out and banged it to them. And they went, oh, yeah, our, our mistake, fair enough. You know, but you think, I wonder what would have happened if we hadn't have done that. How far, yeah. you know, are we, in, uh, what would we be fined? Would we be taken to court? You know, what, what's the deal? Or would they just ask you for the 20 quid? Or, you know, but you just think it's not, it's not worth that loss of sleep for that night really, yeah yeah you when, when you literally just wanted to make a cool film in, in, in yeah. some time that you had free because everything else had messed up with another project you just wanted to yeah. try and make something awesome in that time no I, I even even the cast in that film like there's some really recognizable faces i know you've got lauren sarvey in there who's like he, he's like a, a mainstay in british film now like you see him pop up in so many things i worked on a movie that had him in the, the other dude the play the guy that plays the russian at the start he's also in before dawn i, I know him as shane from shameless shane mcguire yeah but he, he's also in is that right? Is it? Is it? I yeah, take he's it he's an just old your mate friend. Of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, 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 I'm doing something in February as well, and I, I realised I was casting it with exactly the same people, various um, kind of mixtures of people I'd already worked with, really, just because I like that shortcut, and I, I like people that are good. I like people that I don't have to pussyfoot around, and uh, yeah, I usually cast about half the people that I already know, and then then go for auditions and try and get. Uh, the best I can that way but yeah so it, it is usually people that I know really 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 well you know and um and not just because they're cheap and because I can cheeky and bring the price down <laughs> just because you know they, I just know I know the work and I know they're all right to be around because it's stressful mm. in it you know it's stressful and I'm sure you've come across people that are dicks as well and so have we even with before dawn you know you only take yeah. one person that's a yeah. bit of a dick and you just think you're ruining this for me because you're protecting yourself above everybody else and it's not really like that you know we're all trying to get our yeah. best and you know, and so, I've, I've worked, worked on a like... couple of the movies where I've worked on a couple of the movies where there's been someone who's just been an absolute knob for for no reason, and I'm like, in yeah, no, no other circum, no other circumstance would you have ever acted like this. Same with, I, like, without saying uh, even names, like I've worked at certain conventions where we've had a certain guest, and I've been liaising them, and they've been an absolute nightmare, and I'm just like, yeah. why? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, everyone's why? here, why? everyone's here to show you love and respect you, and throw money at you to sign their posters. Like, there's yeah. no reason for you to come up with this kind of attitude. And again, like, yeah. if if you was if if you like, if this was in Sainsbury's and you accidentally bumped into me or something, you'd be the most nicest, respectful person ever. But because you're in like your own little world right now, you have to act yeah. like you're some dickhead. I hate I know, it. But why? Why did it? I'd feel uncomfortable. How do you look people in the eye and be a dick to us? Mm. I just don't. No, get it. I, I don't. I, get won't, it I won't be able to sleep if it were me. I, I'd be so conscious of what other people think about me that I'd, I'd probably act overly nice just so that I was paranoid that someone might think I'm a knob and I would never want anyone to think that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's odd. It's really, really odd. I don't. I, and I've uh, same. I, I think especially when you're filming things, because I've I've been on other people's things and somebody's been like, I think it's because they're out of the comfort zone or they're uh, they feel uncomfortable. And I know um, somebody I work with that said something about the script being saying the director had said, well, if you want to change anything about that, you know, and you think, oh my god, why are you saying that to the actors? That all they want to know is that you know exactly what you're doing and you've got them and you're going to carry them through this. But, you know, in by them saying, if you if you want to change anything, you, you're handing the baton to them and they, f they don't feel safe and it's the worst thing you can do. You want to feel comfortable. Well, you'll, you'll know something that's really good for you is working as an actor for so long and then doing directing. You're going to know what makes a good director. You're also going to know what direction an actor wants to hear from you in order to get the best performance from them. Well, I mean, there is there's something to be said for not being a dick. You know, everybody. <laughs> it's the golden rule, and if you all decide yeah. to be like that, then you you can't fail, really, can you? And if people really rally behind your vision of the movie, you're going to get the best performance anyway because they're going to want to turn in a good performance. It's it's the difference between I, I used to do a lot of like manual labor jobs, like when I was coming yeah. up, and and, I, and I'd worked for companies where you're literally like these these do not give a shit about me. And then the then there's the other boss that turn up with a McDonald's at break and they're like got one of these in foot boys or they pass you a little extra fifty quid as a bonus because you worked hard that week. It makes you want to graft better. It makes you want to yeah. put turn in a good job. So yeah, I think definitely. yeah, he, he does go for any any kind of work. Well, I'm very cautious of your time as well, Dominic, because I know that you, you've. I, I did say I just need an hour of your time and we're almost at that mark, man. So I just wanted to ask before we wrap this up, what what is yeah. next? Without like picking at any scabs, because I know you had this big thing in Hollywood that you were doing it in Port is it Puerto Rico, the six million dollar one? Um Yeah, that's what that's gone that. And then the people that were involved with uh, radar pictures have gone. Radar pictures are still going and Ted Field's still going strong. Uh but and uh but the chap that was sorting that out's moved on and he's independent now and he was trying to get me involved with something else and was like, right, listen, 
come back to me like nearer the time when you've got it all sorted because it's too upsetting. It keeps going. I'm 99% there. And I think in other circumstances, I'd be going, like, amazing, amazing. How can we, you know, this has got to go then. But I didn't believe him. And then again, something else dropped out. I was like, I'm never believing you ever again. I think he believed it. And the problem with Americans is it's all like, yes, 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 yes. Mm-hmm. And really, they should be going like, that. maybe we're going to try our best and the last. But, uh, you know, that's Americans, isn't it? And that's I know Cam, the feeling. And film festivals like that. You come away really? going, Jesus Christ, we're going to make 55 films because everybody said yes. But oh, um, yeah, I bet, really I bet. trying to. I got cast. I got cast in a Malaysian action movie about four years ago. They cast me in a Malaysian action movie because they, they saw some clips from Unit Eleven. They saw me using nunchucks, and they needed a white guy as a vampire hunter. It was <laughs> going to be awesome. And I started training for it. I was running every day. I was doing weights, and I got. My, they sent me a pass. They bought my passport and everything. I'm like, yeah, man, this is happening. And yeah. then it just went dead, and I never heard anything else. So I, even that was a lot smaller. But to, I'm like, yeah, man, I get to act. I want. I want to do more acting. I love acting. I think I enjoy acting yeah. more than directing because of how how much fun you can have with it. So I was buzzing for that. But then. Yeah, the, um, yeah. the that that all fell through. So I, I know the I know the pain there, bro. So have you got something next that's coming out that we can look forward to? Because I love following your career. Yeah. Man. I love seeing you do well, and I'm looking forward to what's next. Yeah, there's one. Um, I, 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 well, I got. I, I, do you know what? I should have texted him before I spoke to you to say, "Can I say anything yet?" Because if you say the name of something, then because it takes like six months to prepare it, and then a year before it's out to the nearest festival. It's old before you get there, so I probably won't say the name, and the name might even change. But well, yeah, a, I know there's uh, an IMDb with... one. IMDb has something that you listed at, so you could probably say that one. I mean, that might be the same. Thing. Maybe that. You, well, yeah. Well, there's something. Called, yeah. So there's something that's definitely filming, and you, it depends whether this lockdown is going to stay where it is. Because I'd like to film it in October, but if yeah. not, then it'll be February. But it involves a lot of sea and underwater filming, and I've got we've got the budget for that. Really? Got the money. We've got the DOP and everything here, so that's definitely going to happen. It's only that it's quite um, it's quite an intimate story, and it's not something I can film with this social distancing and things like that. And you just can't, you can't. So I'm not going to do it until it's ready. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I can wait till February, February, March, I reckon. But if all of a sudden it's, it's open, they say it's gone away, and we've got a vaccine, then I'm running at it. I'm going to do it in October. Um, but yeah, the other one is uh, Lost Dogs, which is that Jeff Lemire um, comic book writer. We bought the rights to that and. We're still trying to. Did you ever see? Oh, Sheffield, yeah, it's a film that cut, set in Sheffield called Funny Cow. Um, no, I've and, never seen it. I've never even heard oh, it's of great. it. Great, I think it's fantastic. I think it's on Netflix actually, or it'll be on Netflix or on um, uh, what's the other one called? Amazon Prime. I'm but, uh, it yeah, up. it's a uh, it's um, Tony Pitts wrote it, and it's uh, Maxine Peake. Uh, it's great. I and love anyway, Maxine people... Peake. Oh, she's amazing. And I just the people... watched the Morb Murderers with her in it again recently. Oh, my God. There's a scene in that when the woman walks into the door and she walks to, from one side of the room to the other and it cuts to Maxine Peake and her eyes watching this person walk from one side to the other. It's scarier than any horror film I've another ever seen. Shot, what another a, shot. What yeah. an actor. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, so the, the people that made Funny Cow are going to make this uh, Lost Dogs, which is a, a, a set in, I think it's set in 1850 or something like that. Um and uh, and and so hopefully, hopefully that will be on the go. But it's still we've bought the rights and it's sat there waiting. Or Studio Pal bought the rights and it's just getting. It's just I can't remember what we're waiting for with that. I think we're in a queue. But hopefully that will be one of the times. But that's great. I really can't wait for that because I read the comic book years ago and then uh, started trying to tout around to try and get the rights and they turned up and said, yeah, 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 all right, we'll get the rights and we'll touch you as direct and we'll get that done. But it's just things are really, really slow with things like that. That's why I'd rather run in and make them at our level and then we can produce them and get them made, you know. Well, uh, it's wicked that, I mean, you don't sound like you're stopping anytime soon. And even no. if every force of nature tried to stop, you would relentlessly push through it and get something done. And even though the thing in Hollywood, even though whatever, I, I keep saying Hollywood, the big, that big $6 million thing, even though that did fall through, it's yeah. just, it's still nice to know that you was even on the radar of people that's got $6 million to spend on a film like that. And that, that, that can only the only way is up from people knowing who you are like that, surely. Well, I've kept the contract. It might never happen again, ever, you know. So, But I've kept the contract with the signature and there's a little like, you know, and I put it in a little frame thinking that may only happen once. But So it was exciting at the time, but you never know. It's not going to kill me. And unfortunately, I had, I had a job to go back to, you know, and uh, my Emmerdale job. So it probably didn't sting as much as it should have done, but it was really, really hurt at the time, you know. But, uh, yeah. Well, but bro, like I said, I can't wait to see what you've got coming out later. I've um, 
what, what you've got coming out next. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this podcast with me. No, bro. no, it's an honour. I love your stuff. I, I love the Thank fact you. You know, that there are certain people that do things and there are certain people that say things all the time. And you're one of the people that does like 99 other things and everything you do is interesting and you're a getter. You know, you don't wake up in the morning and slouch around. You get things done and it's cultural and it's interesting. It's stuff that I'm into. I love the fact that you read comic books as well. I've got so many comics. It's ridiculous. So, really? You know, we're, 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 we're brethren. We're brethren, you know. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Absolutely, no. I, I, I re- it really means a lot that you said that, and to say that you watch Slime House and you've seen Unit Eleven is crazy to me. I, ne- I never, oh, I never great. Even knew, yeah, so. yeah, I love all that. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, awesome, I'll keep man. watching as well. Yeah, but I'll, I'll hopefully, you, I don't know if the festivals will be on this year. If not, I'll see you at the Sheffield Film Festival. Hopefully, absolutely. Like HorrorCon or the uh, Celluloid Screams, because uh, I know HorrorCon's yeah. been uh, re- rescheduled and stuff. So hopefully, we can get up at those I love again. HorrorCon as well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, man, we could we could have that drink this time. So thanks very much for joining me today, Dominic. Is there anything you want to shout out or, or anything like any kind of socials, anything we can get you on just just before we wrap things up? No, I don't think so. About three o'clock this morning, I'll wake up and go, oh, oh God, I should have, I should have said that, I should have said that, I should have said that. And I, I never, ever, ever mentioned. I always, I, I forget because it's people talking to me and asking me questions. But I'm very, we're very, very much. Um, uh, me and Joe, my wife, do everything together to do with the films and I, everything I talk about is I, I only do 50% of it because she does the other 50 really and I, I always understate that in these things and I always think oh I should have said more about her actually you know but yeah. oh no we, we did shout her out enough I, I know I know Joan she makes films herself because I was on the judging panel yeah. at Cellular Screams and she had a short that year yeah 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 well, no, she, was it last year no but it, it was last year I wasn't on the judging panel last year we did the VHS store last year but she she had a short in this in the oh uh, did you have something to do with the VHS store that was like ninety percent of my stuff, yeah. Oh, all the all the VHS. Incredible. Yeah. Oh my yeah, word! We, right, because Ar- did Arrow put the money in for that? Ar- it was hard. It was a collaboration between Slimehouse, Arrow, and Celluloid Screams. Yeah, but the ma- majority of the the tapes were all what I'd brought in, and the posters and props and and wow. the v- VHS racks and everything. And 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 hopefully, again, we can't we can never say for sure. But if if we do get to do that again, then I'll be making it even better next time. Yeah. So if you can come check that out next time, then yeah, that'll yeah, be yeah, even better. brilliant, brilliant. Well, that's another thing. Nice one, Dominic. Fingers in pies. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so much, Theo. Thank you. No worries. No worries. Thanks for the kind words, and I'll catch you soon, dude. Thank you very much. All right. Speak to you soon, mate. So there you have it. There's my conversation with Dominic Brunt from earlier today. How awesome is this dude, man? I love his work ethic. I love how he's just so relentlessly getting this stuff done. It buzzes me out so much. I absolutely love it. I was so happy to know that he'd watched Unit 11 and that he'd been checking out the Slimehouse stuff. Uh, and even after we'd finished doing the podcast and I stopped recording, we talked for like another 10, 10 minutes about movie posters and old movies and that kind of thing. He's the kind of guy that I could talk back and forth with about filmmaking and exploitation movies and horror for, for way more than an hour but I was so cautious that I only had him for an hour so I tried to get in as many questions and stuff as possible without machine gunning him with questions so yeah man shouts to Dominic Brunt so awesome to have him on the show If it's your first time here and you enjoyed the podcast today, then there's plenty of other content over here on the YouTube channel. Like Dom said, he'd been watching us toy hunting in Japan. We've got so much stuff on here from toy hunting to interviews with famous horror stars. All that good stuff. Anything cool, artistic, retro and edgy, you will find it here on Slimehouse TV. We've also got a Patreon. If you go to patreon.com forward slash Slimehouse TV, you can become a slime renegade. And for a small donation every month from as little as $1, you can help us make Slimehouse bigger and better than ever. Once again, thanks so much to Dom for joining us today. I'm Theo Kane. This is Slimehouse TV, Slimehouse social distancing podcast, and we'll catch you in the next one. But for now, I'm gone. Boom.